Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, May 12th, 2022. I'm Liz Exton, the chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Mr. Slickman. In the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Thielman will not be with us this evening. Dr. Allison Ampey. Here. Mr. Carden. Here. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Hayner. Yes. Uh, and the administration, Dr. Holman. Yes. Dr. McNeil. Yes. Mr. Mason. Yes. Mr. Spiegel. Yes. Ms. Elmer. Yes. And our AEA rep, Ms. Keith. Yes. All right. And our student rep, and our student rep, Megan Carmody. Yes. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted in a hybrid model. On February 15th, 2022, Governor Baker signed into law a new session law extending certain COVID-19 related measures. The new law, Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, includes an extension until July 15th, 2022 of the remote meeting provision of the Governor's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others, and if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interests of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment, and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. All right, our first item on the agenda is public comment. We have one public commenter, Cheryl Miller. Miss, I, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I jumped ahead. I'm just gonna read something before you, I apologize. Um, public participation. For members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be up to 20 minutes of public comment. Depending on the number of people who sign up, time allotments may be reduced but will not exceed three minutes each. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be done in 20 minutes, the number of speakers may be capped and will be invited to speak based on the timestamp of their email to Ms. Diggins. The school committee respectfully requests participants of the public to utilize their camera if possible while speaking and to adhere to the public comment policy BEDH that requires participants to provide their name and address. Speakers may offer such objective criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of Arlington Public Schools. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the performance of school personnel other than the superintendent. Additionally, the committee will not hear anything that might identify and or infringe upon a student's privacy by name or incident. If you would like to sign up to speak, please email ediggins at arlington.k12.ma.us by 12 noon on the date of the meeting. I apologize, thank you for, for waiting. Ms. Miller? Hi, um, so my name is Cheryl Miller. I live at 10 Bethesda Street and I'm the parent of two Arlington Public School students. Uh, thank you for giving me time to speak today. Um, I'm here to comment on the proposed job description for a diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist for the Arlington Public Schools. I wish I could say I was surprised to see no mention of disability in this job description, but I'm not. The job description appears to equate diversity, equity, and inclusion with racial justice and anti-racism. I have no desire to minimize the need for anti-racist work within the Arlington Public Schools. That work is central to diversity, equity, and inclusion, but it is not the whole of diversity, equity, and inclusion. In an article entitled, There is no justice without disability, 
Massachusetts Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and disability advocate Rebecca Coakley write, achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion means putting disability justice in every policy discussion and making it part of the continuing struggle for civil rights. Students with disabilities make up 16% of the Arlington Public Schools population. These students are dispropor disproportionately disciplined and disproportionately suspended. For example, at Audison Middle School, between 2018 and 2021, students with disabilities made up between 17 and 19% of the school population. In the 2018-2019 school year, 50% of students disciplined were students with disabilities. In the 2019-2020 school year, 61% of students disciplined were students with disabilities. In the 2020-2021 school year, 80% of students disciplined were students with disabilities. That's on 17.2% of the population that year. Over that time, students with disabilities were three to five times more likely to be suspended from school. In the Arlington Public Schools, students with disabilities do significantly worse on standardized, test, standardized testing than their non-disabled peers. They are less likely to graduate and more likely to drop out of school. I am a disabled person with two disabled children in the Arlington Public Schools. Ableism is pervasive in this school system. It is baked into classroom practices and the assumptions that teachers and administrators make about students and families. Assumptions that lead to kids being disciplined for manifestations of their disabilities, to lowered expectations, and to othering and formal and informal segregation. I am concerned that the job description as written will attract someone with no knowledge of and potentially no interest in disability. This is not acceptable. I ask the school committee to reject this job, job description and invite Arlington Public Schools to think more inclusively about inclusion, not just in this instance, but across the board. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next um, item is our student representative, <coughs> Megan. Thank you for our update. Um, in for the student council, we're currently mainly working on a transition from our current council into the next one with elections happening right now. Um, and then also with the mask mandate coming to the school, I thought the school committee would want to know that it, I think from what I've seen, it's going fairly well. Students have been wearing their masks. And from what I've heard, most people are okay with it and understand that Me it is. Sorry, Megan, safe. I'm going to interrupt you. Is there a way we can make this louder or Megan can talk closer to her microphone? I now she's muted. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Very faintly. Is there, I thought there was a volume that we could turn up in the room. No? Okay. <laughs> we can hear you, Megan. It's just a little soft. Yeah, no, and I. Those of us on Zoom can hear her just fine. Okay. So okay. you're doing a great job, that. Megan. So it's the noise, the, the speaker's here, yeah. Would you like me to repeat yeah, what going. I said? Or? All right, go ahead, Megan. I'm sorry, thank you. Um, that's all I really had to say, but if you want me to repeat it, I can. Yeah, no, I, I would like you to repeat it because that. Okay. The, ma so for the this, masking piece, I'm. Okay. So for the student council update, we are currently working on a transition from our current council into our new one with elections happening right now. And then I thought the school committee want to know that with the mask mandate being um, reinstated at AHS, I think it's been going fairly well and students have been wearing their masks and a lot of students have an understanding that's for our safety and it's been pretty positive feedback with it. Great, thank you, I appreciate you repeating that. All right, um, next is an after school programming report. Um, just for the public, I wanna offer a few uh, words before I turn this over to Dr. Holman. Um, so this report is being given to the school committee as part of policy KFD which um, asks the superintendent to provide us with an update on after school space and the use of surplus space throughout APS's buildings. Um, so the, the information that is being shared here is a snapshot in time. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Homan will share more about this, but I also know this is a, a very, um, something that a lot of people in the community are thinking a lot about and so I want to just make it clear that this report is being given to us today um, based on the date on a policy. All right, uh, Dr. Homan. Thank 
you, Ms. Exton. So I am pleased to be here tonight to share a little bit of information with you about after school programs. I'm more than happy if there's uh, more information that's desired from the community or from the committee uh, for us to share to come back at some point and share more information. My focus tonight is mostly on enrollments and wait lists because these, these have been the topics that we've heard most frequently from the community about. And I would also like to share some next steps that we're taking um, in order to try to expand some of the umbrella care after and before school care available to families in Arlington. So I want to begin by taking a look at our vendor partners, those who come into our schools and run uh, programs that are not directly overseen by the Arlington Public Schools. And I'm going to begin with 2021-22, which is this school year. So as I came in um, and came on board, I heard from a lot of families that they were really hopeful they would be able to gain spots if they were currently on wait lists worked with um, our uh, Arlington After School program as well as um, collaborated with some of our vendor partners to see if there was anything we could do to open up space or available slots. Uh, so when we hit this point in the year, this was the um, this school year 2021-22 highlights with regards to enrollment and wait lists. Our vendor partners were able to accept almost all families who had expressed an interest in enrollment at the start of the school year and wait lists were down um, fairly far with the one exception of a wait list at the Gibbs uh, program, which is the kid care program, which is run by the Arlington um, Department of Recreation still had a few students who were on the wait list um, at this point in the school year. So this is a projection. This next slide is a projection into 2022 and 2023, demonstrating the wait list for the programs that are operated by our vendor partners. So as you can see, if you take a look at just the enrollment numbers themselves, they're going up from 659 last year um, to into next school year an enrollment of 705. So the good news is that we do have more spots that are open for families um, and that are filled. And then we also have an increase in wait lists right now with 195 families sitting on the wait lists for these programs. Um, there could be some overlap between some of these programs and wait lists in some of the Arlington after school programs that I'll talk about next. The most significant wait lists that we have right now are at, the, at, at Dallin um, and at Brackett at Dallin. The only after school program at Dallin is the one that's operated by one of our um, partners and at Brackett there are two programs, one that's operated by a partner and one that's operated by Arlington after school program. For 2021 and 22 Arlington after school program, this is the program operated um, under the umbrella of the Arlington Public Schools by Mr. Todd Morse. Um, in 2021-22, we had this school year, we had an enrollment of 399. Um, that's our current enrollment. We have 91 students who were still on the wait list at the end of this school year who we didn't have spots for that we were able to accommodate. Um, in speaking with Arlington after school program, Folks, some of the reasons for this are challenges with stable staffing and a lot of turnover with regards to staffing, the ability to keep um, folks in these roles, which are part-time. Sometimes they would find full-time work and leave the program, and we had to maintain a certain ratio of students to staff. We have raised hourly wages throughout the year in an effort to attract candidates and open up more available space. Uh, space has not been the primary challenge. Um, space can be a challenge because sometimes programs are sharing space in a school, but the primary challenge really has been the ability to make sure that we have staffing that is stable um, to supervise the students after school. 2022-23 enrollment and wait lists in the Arlington after school program. As you can see, um, more good news is that the current enrollment, the uh, available and filled spots for 2022-23 is 498, and if you look back at the previous year, it's around 400, so we've opened up almost 100 additional spots for next school year. And the current wait list for 2022-23 is also larger. We have 141 students who are still waiting to find out if they can obtain a spot, and that is contingent upon our ability to staff it and open up more space for those students. Uh, the pre-COVID capacity I received from Mr. Morse was 100, about 160 we would cap it at Hardy and Thompson um, before the pandemic. And so as you can see, we're reaching a point where we might be able to hit that capacity once again if we can find the, st the additional staff to reach uh, an enrollment of 160 at Hardy and Thompson. We had previously set some caps actually around 60 at Bracket, but have all already opened up the capacity of the Bracket program to about 80 and 100 at Pierce. That was a newer program from my understanding uh, prior to the pandemic. And so now that that program has been in operation, um, we're looking to open up more spots, but that's gonna, again, be contingent on staffing. So if we can find the staffing to support additional openings, we're open to doing that. And I'd like to talk a little bit about what some of our plans are moving forward. 
One of the things we're doing right now is collecting and compiling financial summaries. This is something that would previously have been part of this report to the school committee. Um, it's something that we, the role that had typically collected that information and compiled it for you was actually left unfilled for a significant portion of the year, but it's now filled in the business office. And so we're working on that. And that's something that we should have and be able to provide to the committee once it's available. Um, we are in the process of uh, holding building-based after-school programming meetings May through June. So these meetings, um, this is not something we've done in the past. We have had meetings with all program directors in one place, uh, but we haven't had meetings at each school site to have a conversation about um, first what the program needs are. We're including community education in these conversations because they sometimes use spaces for um, enrichment programming and uh, make, a, make some plans about what kind of space they're going to be used, how they're going to be rotated. If we are going to use classrooms, that can be an imposition on teachers because the space is you know, set up for their classes. And so if things get touched or moved or relocated, that can be frustrating. So if we are going to be using classrooms or if we need additional space in classrooms, we wanna look into options like rotating, making sure that we're um, sharing the wealth and the love of the after school program across the building and, and that we're not imposing um, on teachers too much but through use of their space. So the goal of these meetings is to have all building leaders and school program leads in one place to have one conversation about what the needs are at that school, how we can open up additional capacity, what our space considerations, agreements and challenges and hopes for the future are going to be. And I have included a sample agenda for one of those meetings in your materials for tonight. We're also investigating the feasibility of before school programming. I'm not in a place where we can make any promises right now about what might be available because once again, this will be contingent on our ability to adequately staff something. But we are taking a look at this at the request of several parents who have voiced the challenges of um, their work schedules and needing some degree of before school care in order to make it to work on time. We're also hopeful that the adjusted start time for elementary can help alleviate some of those burdens on families as well. And we're investigating the potential model for some full-time shared positions for Arlington After School to help with recruitment, retention, and lunch supervision. Um, so one option that we have because the Arlington After School program positions are currently part-time positions is to take a look at whether or not those could be shared with the um, public school system in order to have, for example, somebody who is providing services or aid during lunch times, which can be particularly stretched for staff. And then that person could move over into working for the after school program later in the afternoon and be on a schedule that's later in the day. So those are some options we're looking into at individual schools that might be able to help us uh, make sure that we keep the program staffed and make it more appealing because it's a full-time role. And we're also, of course, recruiting staff for Arlington After School Program. So if anybody would like to work with spectacularly energetic students at the end of a day, um, please feel free to apply or email Rob Spiegel, who will send um, resumes over to Todd Morse. And we're, we're certainly looking for folks and looking to expand opportunities for students to have after school care so that we can clear those uh, wait lists. And with that, I will take any questions that the committee has. Anybody? Kersey, sorry, Dr. Allison Ampey. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Herman, I had a couple questions. Uh, first, I was wondering, is there any way that we can cross-reference all these wait lists to have a sense of how many spots we really need? I am sure that, yes, there is a way. I would have to get the wait lists themselves. Um, and we probably have to do some data cleaning to make sure that the names are all entered in the exact same way and that we're referencing the same we might need to reference addresses or some sort of indicator. So it would take a bit of analytical time to do that, but it's not certainly not impossible. We can try to get the wait list as we're getting the financials at the same time. I'm thinking it'd be good just to make, partly because we don't have a sense of how many spots we need for the district, right? And that would be nice to start understanding. Um, so, and then my second question is just, given that we've now added Ms. Elmer as a second assistant superintendent, who is in charge of the after school programming? Is it you? Is it Ms. Elmer? Is it Dr. McNeil? You know, where, I'm, I'm wondering where it falls in the chain. At the moment, this falls under the purview of the superintendent. Right now it is under my office. I think that as we consider organizational 
um, approaches moving forward and if we wanted to consolidate any other functions in central office we could certainly consider reorganizing it however for right now given the number of um, concerns that I heard in coming on board about access to these kinds of programs I want to maintain it under my role for right now and consider a potential reorganization in the future okay thank you that's all anybody else mr. Cardin uh, yes, thank you. Um, so I want to just make one note and then a question. So this doesn't include this, the sort of off-campus programs at Fidelity House and, and uh, Boys and Girls Club and there's a couple others. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. So I think that's where, Dr. Allison Ampey, where most of the overlap is. People might be on the Gibbs program waiting list and our waiting list, but that's only 22 people. So I think most of the overlap is going to be with those other programs who, as, as I understand, all do have wait lists as of, as of right now. So uh, there's nobody without a wait list. <laughs> um, and then I guess my other question is about the, the private programs. I don't know if they've expressed to you whether they're, uh, they do have at, at Brackett and in, in, um, Dallin, they do have high capacity um, that they're expecting for next year. So is their growth limit for them space or staffing or both still? That's one of the primary questions that I have when we go and do those meetings um, is to take a look at what the current wait list is, say, you know, what are the constraints? Is it that you can't find staff? Is there anything that we can do to help advertise for that? Um, is it that, you know, there are space limitations in the location that you're at? So that's really one of the primary goals for us to discuss at those school-based meetings. And then I guess also in those meetings, one thing that you might want to get a better sense of if you can is why the demand varies so much by school mm -hmm. um, I mean I know that the schools that are closer to Fidelity House and Boys and Girls Club may have more spillover to, to those programs so maybe that's why Brackett and Dallin are so heavily high in demand but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense mm -hmm. to me bishops way out there and they still have high demand they don't have that high demand so I it's kind of confusing why we have a much greater problem at some schools than other schools. Hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right. Um, first, thank you very much for this report. Uh, this is some of the most comprehensive information that we've received about after school. Um, and I appreciate all the work that you are doing and the time that you're going to take to meet with someone at every building to, to get, um, get a better handle on this. I think, as you heard um, in your listening sessions, this is a, a big challenge um, for the community. Um, and so I appreciate your time mm -hmm. with that. Um, uh, the other thing that I just wanna mention is I hope that, that we can bring the, after, the before school care to fruition at some point. There's a, a need for that as well we have a lot of families in arlington who are teachers who need to be in their buildings where they teach outside of arlington before eight o'clock um, and we also have a lot of families who work in the medical area and so also need to be um, downtown at a really early hour so it it's something that i i know you're working on it and i appreciate it and i just will encourage you to to continue to think about that um the, the last thing I just want to make a comment again for the community is that um, the, the wait lists here are really fluid. So Mr. Cardin had asked about overlap. I hear from directors that families will sign up because um, they are thinking about getting a job or they sign up and then don't necessarily need the days. And so I think that it's, it's a really complicated issue. And then there's a family that is working and is a single parent and needs to and and so there's a lot going on um, with with making sure that these spaces are available for for everyone. Um, all right, pretty good. All right, um, AEA resolution on fair share amendment, Ms. Keys. Do you want me here or do you want me in the hot seat? Uh, I th <laughs> um, not. You can see her. Good there. You okay. can see you. Yeah, yeah. No, I just want to. Oh, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Scooch a little bit. Too. See all right. Good evening to all of you. Um, thank you for giving me a chance to speak about the proposed resolution in support of the Fair Share Amendment. The resolution that you have 
is very similar to the one that was unanimously sent from the select board to the town meeting and is awaiting discussion there. Uh, the Massachusetts Fair Share Amendment is a state ballot question that's going to be voted on in November. This is a proposed state constitutional amendment that has been in the works since 2015. It began as a citizen's petition and then morphed into a legislative proposal. It has passed the requisite two constitutional conventions in the legislature and is now awaiting ballot approval from the residents of the state. If passed, this amendment would allow the Commonwealth to impose an additional 4% tax on income over $1 million. The first million dollars earned would be taxed at the flat tax rate of 5% and only income above that would be subject to the surtax. The Massachusetts State Constitution currently mandates a flat income tax, so the constitutional amendment is needed for this. The amendment would require the additional revenue to be directed to transportation and public education. It would raise an estimated additional $1.5 to $2 billion in revenue a year, every year. And in these sectors in particular, one-time funding is not going to be enough, so an ongoing sustained revenue source is critical. On the transportation front, if this is passed, it would serve to maintain and improve our public transportation system, could, uh, could support climate resilient transportation measures like electrifying more of our system and allowing us to invest in alternative transportation modes like protected bike lanes. Here in Arlington, many of our students depend on public transportation to get to school, particularly at the secondary level. So this is of particular interest. In addition, as we look to attract more hires to the community, particularly many of our paraprofessionals or after school workers who take public transportation, we have a vested interest in making these improvements. On the public education front, this additional revenue could help pay for universal pre-K for working families. It will allow the state to fully fund the Student Opportunity Act for grades K to 12 and help our state reinvest in public higher education, including community colleges, state colleges, and universities, which would allow young people to graduate without crushing debt. The amendment was carefully crafted to consider which residents are in the best position to pay a little more towards critical state services. Income inequality has increased dramatically over the past several decades. The top 1% of income earners in Massachusetts now collect 24% of the total income of the state. You need to make almost $600,000 a year to be counted among the top 1%. So this measure would affect less than 1% of Massachusetts residents. It's about 0.6%. The additional 4% surtax on income over a million dollars would bring top earners closer to alignment with everyone else in terms of the total percentage of taxes paid as a percentage of their income. By asking a little more from those in the best position to support increased state revenue, we can make transformative changes in our system's public education and transportation sectors for our families and workforce for generations to come. This additional revenue would support citizens across the state, particularly low-income residents and people of color who have been disproportionately impacted by reduced state aid in these sectors. And in addition, this change would benefit our municipal budget by increasing state aid for public school students and increasing funds available for transportation-related projects. The Arlington Education Association, along with Massachusetts Teachers Association, has already endorsed this amendment, and we are asking you to take the same step tonight towards increasing funding for our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Would somebody like to make a motion, and then we can have a discussion? Mr. Schlickman? A uh, motion to adopt. Second. All right, any discussion? Okay. Yeah, Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, I don't know how as a school committee that we, we would not want to uh, make sure that the Commonwealth has the revenues required to provide quality education and transportation uh, for, you know, for the residents of the state. And it's very unusual that Massachusetts has a constitutional uh, limit on the way we uh, tax income. And so this unusual amendment is required. Uh, it's good public policy, and I'm very uh, glad we're uh, endorsing it, and I hope the voters approve it in November. Anybody else? All right. A roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Alice Adampi? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. And I vote yes. Thank I you. Vote. Six, six, Thank you unanimous, but six, nothing because Mr. Dillon's not here. All right. Thank you, Ms. Keyes. 
All right. Approval of job description for diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist. Uh, yep. Dr. Homan or yeah. Mr. Siegel. So uh, we are bringing this uh, job description to the school committee and we have not spoken yet about this job description in subcommittee. Part of the reason why we're bringing it to the committee tonight for consideration is because we are eager to post for it. We know that positions like these, we really want to make sure that we attract uh, strong candidates for these roles and they need to be posted for a certain period of time. And so our hope is that we can um, get any revisions that might be required from the committee and uh, move forward with them and be able to post as soon as possible for this role. I want to thank Ms. Miller and um, one other member of the community who saw the job description and raised the concerns that we heard about earlier this evening. We have revised the job description that's in your materials for tonight in Novus to include a clause in the job goal portion that articulates that the goal of this role is really to support initiatives addressing all intersectional identities inclusive of race, gender, religion, ability, um, and many other different things that if we were to list all of them here um, would really take up most of the job description. I think the intent certainly was not to leave out um, certain uh, areas of equity work that we know are critically important for our students, um, but to use language like issues of social justice that are inclusive of social justice for our students with disabilities, our students from uh, with different um, identities in terms of gender, with different identities in terms of sexual orientation. So certainly um, that it wasn't our intent to leave anybody out. Uh, it is our intent to have a role here that's going to support our teachers in developing their practice around um, inclusive, uh, inclusive classrooms and making sure that all students have what they need and we're able to meet them where they are in the context of the core classroom as well as in the context of interventions. So with that in mind, we're happy to take any uh, questions that the committee has about this job description and to make any revisions that the committee would recommend before we post. Mr. Hainer. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions. Number one, in, in the job description, uh, how are you going to ensure that the person has a background in this area that was mentioned tonight by the speaker? I will start, but if any other members of my administration want to add on to what I say, welcome them to do so. Um, I think that a lot of that will come out in our job um, hiring process. We tend to ask a lot of questions about what, you, what candidates' experiences are in these areas regardless of the role, but obviously for this role, it's going to focus on that. What kinds of um, experience do you have? Can we see it in the resume leading professional development around issues of equity? Um, what background do you have working with students from diverse backgrounds? Um, and diverse backgrounds being everything in that list as well as other identifying factors for students. Uh, to, and we will ask them to also do performance tasks, which for this particular role could include something like doing professional development, doing a mock session with us um, so that we can see, is it interactive? Is it universally designed? Is it meeting the needs of every learner in the room? Are we modeling the practices that we need to see in order to meet the needs of neurodiverse students in the room, in order to meet the needs of students who come from different racial backgrounds in the room um, or anything else. So the goal is to make sure that uh, these people interact with multiple stakeholders in our community, including families. Um, we include a mem we will be including members of CPAC on hiring committees as well, moving forward based on feedback that we've gotten in, in the last couple of searches. So those measures help us really get a full picture of candidates and we're practicing them on a regular basis. Thank you. My other question is, if there's an incident, um, how, how is it going to be handled? Is it going to be treated like any other incident or discipline? Does it go up a chain or how does it work? How do you perceive it working? A negative incident regarding uh, a disability or a racial issue or something that would be in the purview of this person. So this specialist will be in an AEA role. And so when we have issues of, so for example, Dr. McNeil is our civil rights coordinator. When we have um, a complaint that comes to us about discrimination, those would go through his office. Sometimes the director of DEI gets involved, particularly in issues of discrimination. 
And when we're doing the proactive work, that's where Ms. Thomas will often step in to have a restorative conversation with the family or to work with the teachers to think about how pedagogy it might have impacted the situation and what we can adjust or, but when we have an investigation or something that really needs to be looked into in terms of um, disciplinary action or other follow-up actions or reporting to the state, that's something that goes through the assistant superintendent's office. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Cardin. Uh, so just one, one suggested edit. When I looked at the, this position description compared to the director description, one, one difference is instead of saying anti-racist curriculum, we said anti-racist and anti-bias curriculum. So I, I would suggest you make that change. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ellis Zanampi. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking at the updated description and um, I would agree with Ms. Miller that even the updated description seems very heavily, it, it mentions race seven times, it mentions ability in the context of students once. And I do feel that if we're trying to get someone who's also working to make sure that our students with disabilities are having their diversity and, and, and being included in this stuff, that this job description doesn't quite capture that. Um, so I would, question whether there's a way of tweaking it. Um, I wouldn't maybe um, being more overtly descriptive of, of what's being discussed. Um, but that, that I don't, my point is I don't have words for you. I would trust you to add something, but I personally would feel better if something was added overtly that would be very clear what we're trying to say. That's all. Ms. Morgan. Um, so I actually brought this up earlier this week when I noticed that um, it was a unit A position, which are student facing, right? Um, and that we uh, typically, and I did go back and look and, and the unit A position ads that have happened over the last three years have all come through the CIA subcommittee. We've definitely had administrative positions that haven't, but those, those unit A positions have done um, and they've been iterated. And I, you know, before we heard from some families today, I was, you know, I was trying to sort of go along with the desire of the superintendent and the chair to get this done and posted. And I guess I just, I feel like at this point, it's, it's, there's, there's the, the risk of waiting two weeks to actually take a look at it, really, you know, make sure that it, the, the language is the way that we want it is the risk of that is less than the risk of just rushing ahead to get it posted. So um, it it just seems to me, it seems to me that there's a little bit more work that needs to be done um, and, it's, and it's an important position. Um, so that's where I'm at. I, I guess the question I have for Dr. Holman is that you alluded to there being a hiring committee that would include CPAC members. Do we really have hiring committees for unit A positions is that like a thing i mean it, it's never anything i've ever seen before but um if that's the plan for this position that's pretty atypical i would think that um that the you know the dei director and and others that she would put together a team and and hire someone as is typical with with unit a positions but i i don't know if there's a plan on doing a search for this um, I guess I'd like to hear more about what that's going to look like. Look, we have a CIAA subcommittee meeting coming up next Friday. So bringing a revision of this job description back to that committee for further discussion, given some of the concerns that have come up, makes perfect sense, and we'd be happy to do that. Um, 
with regards to hiring searches, I sent out, and I'm happy to share this with the committee, a set of expectations with regards to hiring searches that includes hiring searches for AEA positions, for teaching positions, and that asks that administrators do everything they can to include students where appropriate, family members, um, important and relevant community organizations for this particular job post. I would think that the CPAC would be one of those um, in hiring committees as part of a search as well as performance tasks as part of the search. It's not always realistic to do that for every role, particularly when we get into what I would call the reactive hiring season that happens in the summer. But right now we're in sort of the proactive hiring season. And so we can do a more rigorous search and that's a recruitment strategy when candidates see that we are very serious about inclusion in our hiring committees and our process there they go and they tell their friends and that gets us um, stronger candidates as part of our searches so yes the answer would be we do include family members um, teachers have hiring committees for AEA level positions and because this one will be heavily involved in doing professional development for teachers. We want to make sure we have good teacher representation on this hiring committee as well. That's great. Fantastic. Thank you very much. If it, would it be possible for us to get some sort of like redacted or no like of that um, communication? Because my understanding is that's a, a significant change in practice, which um, I'm thrilled that we're doing. Um, but it would be helpful to understand, you know, how that's being messaged, I guess. I can absolutely share what was shared with our administrative team. Um, I do know that there has been striving to do a lot of this, uh, but not necessarily always a consistent expectation that it happen as, in as many searches as possible. So, yeah. That's great. Well, and it's, I, to my knowledge, it's never been really canonized in any kind of like written communication. So that's. Very good. Thank you so much. Mr. Hainer. Just for the old man to be clear, did I understand the superintendent say that we're going to hold off on this and they're going to bring it to CIA and then I bring it back to us on the night on the, the next meeting? I think it's fine for us to do that yeah. if it's okay with the rest of the committee. Yeah, Dr. Allison Ampey. I'd be happy to have CIA um, approve it for us and would be willing to make a motion towards that uh, if people so wanted. I'm going to I'm going to take a turn before um, we go back to that. So um, first, I just wanted to comment on the process. Uh, so when this came when this position came to me and then uh, Dr. Holman and Ms. Creedle Thomas asked to put it on the agenda. I asked the same question about does this go to CIA or not? Um, and it, there was no written document that said that AEA positions go to um, go to CIA and it wasn't in the description of CIA's responsibilities. So that was how this was placed on on this full agenda this way. I think that if if in the past three years that's something that's been done, then it sounds like it's something that we as a committee should codify somewhere and not just rely on past practice when there may be new administration or new um, school committee members uh, chairing, chairing meetings, newer school committee meetings, chairing meetings. Um, so I'll just put that out there as a comment about the process. Um, I. I, all, I, at, having heard from community members and thought about this, I, um, I also think that it makes sense to have uh, CIA take a look at this uh, next week. So, Mr. Hainer, is that your hand for that? Two things. Number one, because the job descriptions come to us. This is the first one I've seen on AEA one, but since the job descriptions come to us, it should go through our subcommittee. Uh, that's one point. The other point is, I would like to see this come before the full committee for approval. Uh, not that I don't trust the CIA, but I think it's important for the whole community to see the work that we're doing. It one should not take long. It, it, I, I will accept the CIA's recommendation at the meeting, but I think it's important to do it in a public, a totally public venue of the school committee. Thank you. Mr. Schuckman. Mr. Hainer makes an important, an important point. Now, the thing is, is that it's not often that there are job descriptions for uh, 
AEA positions because generally speaking, we know what a, a, a third grade teacher is. So usually the, it's the one of a kind positions that we're getting job descriptions for, which are either uh, administrative union or non-union non uh, executives. So yeah, that, that's sort of where the confusion is coming. Now, I have full faith in the CIAA subcommittee of, as a member, uh, but I think generally speaking, if you get three members of, of a subcommittee approving something, generally speaking, we are on a glide path to uh, getting full committee approval. So my recommendation would be to uh, bring it to CIAA, get an approval from them in, in allowing the administration in their wisdom to post it with the line in the description pending school committee approval so that we can put it out without having the full commitment to the exact wording of the job description we're putting out. That means that a, an applicant will see that there's a possibility that the job description may be tweaked, but uh, at least we're out a little earlier in the job market. And I don't think that requires a motion. I think that's sort of a direction we're going. <clears throat> Do committee members object to us just mm -hmm. letting CIA take it? Just... Mm -hmm. okay. can, actually, sorry, can I ask one other question um, about the position? So it's called a specialist, but it sort of, it reads a bit like a coach. Mm -hmm. Just how did you decide on specialist versus coach? So this is intentional. It's linked to the um, work that we've been doing around uh, coaching design. Dr. McNeil, do you want to speak to this a little bit? Yeah, so in positions, so when we hire individuals, we have a, a certain teams. And so in language arts, <coughs> ELA, and... Um, math we have a number of coaches that we can have be at the building and, th and that is our expectation for next year with our literacy coaches that they'll be building based when we have other content areas such as social studies and science we are leaning towards having them be uh, content specialists because they're not able to work with uh, teachers individually because just their capacity and only being a couple of one or two in that department it would be um, unfair to have that expectation that they can work with all the teachers within the district. So they're going to be more of content specialists. And I think that is what we're going with um, in this particular position as well, that they will focus on uh, professional development, work with uh, curriculum leaders, um, work with building administrators to look at the uh, delivery of instruction, work with Margaret our, or Ms. Thomas, our director of DEI, um, with her and, and be more of a global and do more of the professional development that will impact classroom instruction. So it is because of that, because of the capacity and the number of people in those different um, content areas that we have to uh, term this as a specialist or, and we're also doing that, we're, we're thinking of doing that, making that shift with our social studies and uh, science coaches as well. Thank you. I would add that the if we, when we think about when we worked with the coaching design team that Dr. McNeil brought together and we had consultants who worked with them and they really sort of differentiated between the role of the district-wide coaches or what we might want to term specialists and the role of a building-based coach who's in the same building with the teachers every single day, might do more deeper coaching cycles, might be more involved in things like ACE block meetings, whereas the, the people who are district-wide, the coaches or specialists who are district-wide really have a very sort of... Um, higher level view, district level view, and are doing a lot of curriculum development work. So mm -hmm. we're seeing this as a district level, not that we're trying to aim towards building-based coaches in DEI. We might have more specialists over time, um, but that this is a district-wide role, so we're just making that adjustment to language now. We would have to go back and adjust language on the other job descriptions in the future if we wanted to do that um, with those roles too. No, thank you, and that's a helpful distinction to have. Um, okay, so we are, so CIA will take this up at their meeting next week. It can, if approved there, will be posted pending approval by the full committee at our next meeting. All right. Oh, no, I've lost my agenda. I think is it your report? <laughs> All right, the superintendent's report, Dr. Hoban. 
So I apologize, I have not yet updated the Arlington case rates for this week. So that is still showing last week's um, Arlington average daily case rate. But as you can see from the chart on the left with our Arlington Public Schools COVID cases, we are very close to reaching the height um, levels and likely will over the next several days that we were reaching in January when Omicron um, hit. And so I'm gonna speak a little bit as I move forward here about some of the measures that we've been taking with regards to masks and some of the reasons behind that um, in, in response to the rising case rates in Arlington schools. So I'll do that now. Um, so we have, as the community knows, instituted um, indoor masking requirements at Dallin, Gibbs, Bishop, Arlington High School, and Monotomy Preschool. And since I created uh, this slide, we have also instituted a requirement at Audison Middle School in response to rising cases at those schools. Um, the monotomy mask requirement with an exemption is intended to extend through the month of May. That has been in place since the um, masks were made optional earlier this year, I think at the end of February. We are only instituting mask requirements when school-based spread is threatening our staffing levels. So I think there, there can be a little bit of a misconception that what we're trying to do is prevent COVID infection. Um, that's, it is you know, certainly a goal. We don't want, want our students to be sick, but really what we need to make sure we maintain is our ability to um, keep services going and keep our buildings open. So when school-based spread is reaching a point where it threatens our staffing levels and our ability to keep the building safely open and operating and giving students the services they need or is threatening our ability, particularly at Audison and the high school, to have the events that students love at the end of the school year, we wanna make sure that those can, those can still happen, um, then we're instituting a mask requirement on a case-by-case -case basis for a very short period of time and lifting it as soon as we can um, and we are currently also under a strong recommendation that even if you are in a building that's mask optional, that you consider wearing a mask um, and we you know, leave it to the discretion of students and teachers to think about if they want to have moments where they take it off or put it back on. Um, we wanna give people the flexibility for that, but we also wanna signal to the community that these rates are high enough that they are um, threatening our ability to make sure that we have a fully staffed school and that is concerning because one of the things we've said from the very beginning of the pandemic is that, or from the very beginning of the pandemic, but also really from the beginning of this year is that our number one priority is to make sure we stay open for in-person learning and that we keep kids in school as much as possible. And when a student gets COVID, they are out for a week and that's not insignificant, at least a week, and that's not insignificant when it comes to learning. I wanna emphasize that each situation is really unique and we make decisions in consultation with the Department of Health and nursing teams at each school. Um, we don't have a number of cases that we hit that results in a mask requirement because it really depends on the number and the, the amount of time it takes for that number of cases to come in. If it's very swift, then that means that we have some level of exponential spread. If it's slow over time, we could have 20 cases over the course of an entire week, not as concerning as 20 cases in the space of 48 hours. So it really depends on each situation and we assess each one as it comes. We don't make the decisions lightly and we're open to working with families when there are extenuating circumstances. We've had several come up in order to allow for exceptions when it's um, instructionally beneficial for a student not to have a mask on, for example, or when it's particularly difficult for a student to wear a mask. So that's the update with regards to indoor masking requirements. We do have a school that um, moved, I believe Gibbs moved into a strong recommendation today after tamping things down pretty swiftly. These measures do work. We see case rates slow significantly and we see outbreaks cease uh, once we put masks on for about a week. And we have several schools who do not have an outbreak right now. They have a slow and steady number of students who, or teachers who get infected and are out for a little while, but it's not spreading at the same rate as it might be in another setting. So we're doing everything we can to make sure things um, stay stable and that we're able to stay open and give students as joyful of an end of the school year as we possibly can. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that when I'm done with my update. I'd also like to update the committee on our strategic planning work. We had our third meeting this week um, on Monday. And it's you know, hard to have a late evening meeting on a Monday, but the team was high energy and we had fun. We revisited some of the data analysis and synthesis statements that we had done at the previous meeting which brought a wealth of data together and um, attempted to reach some conclusions about what we were seeing in various sources of data about the Arlington Public Schools. We started a noise analysis of Arlington Public Schools data. A noise analysis is a protocol of needs, opportunities, improvements, strengths, and exceptions that we see 
in what we're analyzing. And we started that work with strengths and had some really um, engaging and immersive conversations about the strengths of the Arlington Public Schools that really brought a smile by the end of the meeting. It was wonderful to hear all the things that we think we're really great at here. Um, we have some themes emerging so far in the work of the team. Um, we're hearing that Arlington Public Schools stakeholders who are part of the strategic planning team would like to have a better understanding of what deeper learning and equity look like when you put them together. What does it mean for students to have really deep and enriching experiences and what does it mean when those experiences are truly equitable when every student has access to them. Um, the team is looking for coherence across focus areas, data sets and reporting methods. I think we sense a bit of um, incoherence and in sort of what is, our, what is our North Star? What is it we're striving towards? What is it that we really want to all be about? And a feeling that we don't always disaggregate data in the same way, we don't always talk about what we see in the data in the same way, and there's a desire for us to come to a vision that gives us that coherence as a district so we all sort of know what we're striving for together um, across stakeholder groups and across levels in the system. And then there's also a theme emerging around how we can achieve some symmetry between student, teacher, and systems level experiences. A lot of talk about how, you know, if teachers feel a certain way at school, or if they don't, then how could they possibly inspire students to feel a certain way or not? Um, and so there's a desire for the teacher learning to echo the student learning that we want to see for teachers to have that experience to have deeper learning relation and build relationships with their colleagues in the same way that we want to see students do that with each other and with their teachers. So those are some of the things that we're talking about and thinking about. We have a marathon session next week with sessions on Monday and Tuesday and then more sessions in the two weeks that follow. We have four in-person ones left if we don't have to schedule additional ones. And we're looking forward to having some drafts of vision and mission statements ready for the committee to review before too long. I included some of the materials from this work in your packet for today as well. I'd also like to give you an update on the Deeper Learning Dozen conference that we went to um, this past week. I want to thank the committee for supporting uh, members of our administrative team in participating in the Deeper Learning Dozen work. We went to a pre-convening where we learned some of the principles and frameworks of the group, which has been convening now for the last four years. So this is not a new group that we've joined. It's a professional learning community that has existed for a little while and is convened by the Harvard Graduate School of Education. The host was the Abbotsford School District in British Columbia. We visited elementary, middle, and high schools. We learned about how um, vision, mission, and deeper learning are implemented in that district across the entire district. It's a very, fairly large district that has a large number of indigenous um, students in it. We learned about work to improve educational equity from the students and for the students in the indigenous communities in Abbotsford when you, when you go to Canada and they talk about equity, they're often talking about equity in terms of indigenous identity. So um, it was interesting to hear and think about how that translates um, in the US. We talked about the needs for the Arlington Schools team as we enter into strategic planning and how we can make this work um, dovetail with the strategic planning work that we're doing. And we plan for opportunities to expand the DLD work um, to teacher and leadership teams throughout the district in the 2022-23 school year. And we're still thinking about some of that. Arlington Public Schools has done a lot of uh, work around deeper learning already. I know the social studies team in particular has thought a lot about what deeper learning looks like and experiences that they can build for students that are deeply experiential and let them really think about a topic in depth. Um, so we're looking forward to doing more of that. And I don't know if anyone from the team, wanted, I don't, you don't have to say anything. I'm totally putting you on the spot, but a bunch of them went, so. Uh, no, I think it was a very profound experience uh, personally for me. Um, it, does, it definitely uh, makes me think and reflect on our current practice and understand how we can integrate the characteristics of, uh, of what a deeper learning experience looks like into what we're already doing. Um, there was a big emphasis on connection and reflection and understanding um, and given, given us an, an opportunity to connect what we personally value with the work that we do. And I think that is something that can, is going to impact my practice, especially through professional development and how I model that and how um, we design professional learning experiences for our, uh, for our staff so that it will be reflective and, and replicated within the classroom. And that's something that, um, around the principle of symmetry that Dr. Holman mentioned. So um, I really enjoyed it and I think that was uh, worthwhile to also speak to educators from across the country and hear about the things that they're doing 
around deeper learning within their district. So, and actually, we actually witnessed a conversation that, that was going on at the elementary. So I, I went to and visited the elementary schools and they had uh, one experience that they had outdoor classrooms. And they talked about how they have integrated that and how it was connected to the culture of the indi indigenous people to be connected to nature. So it was very uh, profound. I learned a lot and um, I'm, I'm excited about um, implementing and, and sharing our knowledge with uh, the rest of our colleagues. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Ms. Elmer didn't get to join us. We very much missed her, but Mr. Mason came in her place. And that's a picture of us in a longhouse, a Native American longhouse in British Columbia, which was a really exciting experience because they don't typically let folks into those spaces because they're very sacred spaces. So it was uh, really an honor to be able to be in that space and to learn about the indigenous cultures in that area. A few other updates quickly. We have had a lot of staff appreciation ceremonies, including one today to honor our retirees, those who have given us um, years of service and those who attain professional status. We had a school nurse appreciation celebration um, yesterday in honor of our incredible school nurses on uh, Massachusetts School Nurse Day. We had, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the 10 minute adjustment to elementary school time. And I will uh, provide some clarification language also in future um, updates to families. We made this adjustment in order to ensure that we're meeting time on learning expectations for our elementary students. And we adjusted the start of the school day based on feedback both from teachers um, and feedback from families who are working families and said that that time at the beginning of the day might be appreciated. Um, we did consider end of the school day time. There were a number of reasons why we didn't uh, approach the adjustment by looking at the end of the school day. Um, some of that has to do with how much time we were able to gain by putting this at the beginning of the school day. Other considerations include transportation and the fact that when you add time at the end of the school day, you impact transportation across the entire district. Um, there are other reasons as well that I'll share with families as we move forward, but we're looking forward to having that additional time on learning at the beginning of the school day and beginning the elementary school day at eight o'clock in the morning. I want to remind the community that early release days on Wednesdays for all levels in 2022-23 will be, um, or the early release days will be on Wednesdays for all levels and not on Tuesdays for elementary. Uh, we have tried to reiterate this in several communications and I just wanna make sure it's clear to families that Wednesdays will be the day that all levels have early release days and that's to accommodate some of the work we'd like to do around professional development district wide. Um, I wanted to uh, just let the committee know that we're look, taking a look at how to make sure that our eighth graders can go on a traditional field trip to Canopy Lake Park and that that might require some adjustments to a school day for eighth graders um, later on this school year. I will have more details about this once I have some more details about it from the school administration, but essentially we're running into transportation issues with this field trip and we still want to make sure we're able to do it. In order to do it, we need to use Arlington Public Schools transportation and that means that we have to avoid the drop off times at the end of the school day. So an adjusted day backwards for some Audison students um, later on in the school year so that they can do this may mean that students arrive at school a little bit later and that their day ends a little bit later and we're working with the transportation department to figure out the details of this. It could also mean that students who are traveling to a music festival somewhere else in the state need to be transported to a neighboring community of Woburn by their families early in the morning to participate in that Great East Festival. And this is also linked to the transportation challenges. So I have more details about this. I will discuss them with committee members. If you have any particular concerns, please feel free to give me a call. Um, and we're working out the logistics and we'll be communicating them with families as soon as we have nailed down what we are able to do and what we think the plan will be. Um, but we really wanna make sure that we can still have this experience for our eighth grade students. Um, an update on administrative hiring searches. Uh, we have done the finalist interviews this week for director of wellness. Um, we had a rigorous process for them to do a performance task with myself and Dr. McNeil. Um, and we are looking forward to finalizing and announcing who the candidate, the final candidate for this will be um, very soon. We are currently in the initial interviews. We did the initial interviews for director of visual arts this week initial interviews for Arlington High School Special Education Coordinator this week, um, and the Director of History and Social Studies and Bracket Assistant Principal positions are posted, and we will look forward to launching those searches very soon. And that is all I have for you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Ms. Keith. I just have a comment just to, because I know I'm gonna hear it. The change to the elementary start time is pending approval of the yes. proposed Unit A contract. Any comments or questions from the committee? 
Dr. Allison Ampey. Oh, I see, Jean. Thank you. Um, also, about the uh, 10 minute earlier start, I'm wondering when kids can enter the school because my understanding was the start time is they're supposed to be sitting down ready to learn at eight o'clock. So when can they come in? And if you don't know, I, I'm just thinking that's actually a very helpful number to be communicating out to parents. Yep. Um, we so, are, we are, you. yep, we are working on the details of that. We will communicate it as soon as it's ready. We, our intention is for learning to begin at eight o'clock. So for us to have the systems in place to make sure the students can enter the building so that they are in their classrooms at eight o'clock and learning can start then. Uh, Ms. Morgan. I just had a quick question about the, um, the, the eight o'clock start and the buses for Metco. Are, are those, like, are those kids at elementary, are they already here by eight o'clock routinely or will their bus times be pushed earlier or do we just not know that yet? Yeah, so they are here at eight o'clock. They're actually often here around 7.45 um, and are often in breakfast at 7.45. So we're not anticipating that this is gonna need to push their arrival time. There is one bus at Hardy that comes close, I think, to the 8 a.m. start time. I talked with Ms. Smith about this not too long ago. Um, and But we don't anticipate that we need to change anything about that. We might just need to take a look at the breakfast protocol and make sure that those students can still grab breakfast as they start class. Fabulous. It might be great. I actually, I did hear from two Metro parents uh, that now, now, and, um, we so can't. it might be good enough to get like a special message from Ms. Smith or something. You can connect yep. with I Ms. Smith. Yeah, I will connect with Ms. Smith. I just okay. talked to her about this the other day, and I'll make sure that we're clear that this isn't going to change transportation times from Metco buses. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I just wanted to make one comment actually also related to Metco with uh, relation to the field trip. Um, Mr. Schlickman and I hosted a chat with the Metco families and um, heard some comments about the challenge for uh, junior prom, which I realize mm -hmm. is different than eighth grade field trip, but the timing for them to get home and get back. And so just with this adjustment to transportation in a school day for the eighth graders, I wanna make sure that our Metco students are um, included and have the transportation that they need to get here in the morning and the transportation they need to get home in the afternoon. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. You're all set, Dr. Hillman? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. All right, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 22242, dated May 3rd, 2022, in the amount of $567,010.50. Regular meeting minutes, April 28th, 2022. Approval of the Ida Robbins Scholarship for 2022 presented to the top two AHS students with the highest GPA. Approval of the E. Nelson Blake Book Award given to the top 12 students with the highest GPA. The AHS Awards Night will be held on Thursday, June 2nd at 7 p.m. Uh, can I get a motion? So move. move to approve. And a second from Mr. Hayner, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Roll call vote. Mr. Hayner? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. And I vote yes. It's unanimous. Uh, subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey? Budget will be meeting next week. Um, I'm still in the process of scheduling the meeting. Thank you. Community relations, Mr. Hainer? Nothing to report at this time. Uh, CIAA, Ms. Morgan? Uh, we're going to have a meeting next week on Friday. Mr. Thielman is not here. Policies and procedures, Mr. Schlickman? Uh, we're scheduling. Okay. Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman's not here. Dr. Allison Ampey, do you have anything pertinent? <laughs> it's 
demolition is underway. Um, the updates show pictures of what's going on. It's been going reasonably well. Uh, and that's all I can think of right now. Great, uh -huh. thank you. All right, liaison reports. Okay, announcements. If I may, uh, yeah. the third grade at Gallon today had their mock town meeting, uh, presented four articles, uh, three passed, one failed, the one that failed was increasing fines for littering. First uh, time you get caught littering would, would have cost $500. The second time was 1000 They thought that was a little excessive, so they defeated that out. It was a great day for the children. And I want to thank, publicly thank the three, the four teachers at Dallin for phenomenal work, and the children did a great job. Thank you. Anything else? Nope. Uh -oh. okay. Future agenda items. All right, um, we will now enter into executive session uh, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negoti negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted AEA AAA negotiations and approval of executive session minutes from April 28th, 2022. We will not be returning to open session. Can I get a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. And a roll call vote. Mr. Hayner? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. And I vote yes. It's unanimous. All right, we are in executive session.